Hey everybody, my name is Adam Peck Richardson and I am a field biologist working as a faculty research assistant at Oregon State University in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, I work primarily with seabirds and marine ecosystems um, and today I'm coming to you live from Middleton Island in the Gulf of Alaska. So Middleton Island stretched out behind me, um, Gulf of Alaska here, and then in the very distance you can see Montague Island maybe. Um, that's the southern edge of Prince William Sound, about 50 miles north of us. Um, so we're really out in the middle of the ocean. Um, Middleton Island is a really unique place. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, but it's really also pretty strange. And so in this video, I just want to give you a brief overview of the island, an introduction to the seabirds that nest here during the summer, and talk about the research that happens here, introduce you to some of the crew and some of the work they're doing. Uh, but before I do that, I really need to give you some background on the island. Um, there's a few things that make this island unique, and I'm going to start by taking you down to the shipwreck. So the shipwreck is down here, um, and that's where I will see you next. All right, so here we are. We're down at the ship. So this is the wreck of the USS Colebrook. This was a World War II supply ship, um, and sometime in the late 40s or mid 40s, I guess, um, the ship was crossing the Gulf of Alaska and it was being trailed by a Japanese submarine. And so realizing that if they got torpedoed, all would be lost, uh, the captain and crew made the decision to run the ship to Middleton Island um, and run it aground. So everyone on board survived, um, but the ship was a total loss. Uh, it was unsalvageable. And so here it is today. Um, and now it is home to one of the more unique seabird colonies in the world, I would think. Um, and so the ship is home to kittiwakes, black wake, like kittiwakes, um, pelagic cormorants, and then up on top, we've got tufted puffins um, and common murs. And then way up right up here in the crow's nest, in the literal crow's nest, is um, a bald eagle nest. So I'm gonna flip the camera around and give you all a closer look. Okay, so as I approach the ship, you're gonna see um, near the bow of the ship on all of the cross members, ribs, um, and stringers. Um, there's a bunch of bl nesting black leg kittiwakes. So they've really used all of the internal structure. And then as I approach the inside of the ship, you'll see a bunch of the um, uh, adults that are not incubating or brooding chicks um, should flush out. It's pretty spectacular. All right. So you can see the kittiwakes coming into view. Some of them are leaving their nest. So the chicks are pretty big. Um, they're nearly fledged. We don't want to get too close. We don't want to force fledge any chicks. Um, but you can see the kittiwakes there. And then inside the ship here is a whole kittiwake colony. So as I approach, here they come. All right, and then I'm going to back off. But if we look up high, now we can see that they're whoop, nesting pelagic cormorants. So the pelagic cormorants are right in here and up along here. And you've got uh, pelagic cormorants lining the entire wheelhouse. And then in the vegetation way up on top, We've got nesting tufted puffins, common murs. Um, if you stand here with binoculars, you can actually watch murs walk in and out of the hallways. Um, really quite spectacular. Okay, so in addition to being a spectacular seabird colony, the ship is evidence of the island's past. So we have a huge ship that now sits at the high tide line, not out in the water like it did when it first ran aground. And the reason for this is because of the 1964 earthquake. So the Good Friday earthquake was the largest earthquake ever recorded in the Northern Hemisphere, and it still is today. It's the second largest earthquake ever recorded on Earth. Um, and the epicenter was just about 100 miles north of here. So in pretty much an instant, the entire island was lifted, um, uplifted about three meters, or a little bit more than 10 feet, and this ship came right up with it. And so this means that the whole island, as I pan and look behind us, we can see this huge coastal plain laid out behind me. This was all intertidal, and now it's above the high tide line. So this created a whole new type of habitat along the edge of the island, but it also had severe implications for the cliffs that the seabirds used to rely on. 
So I'm gonna head down that way and talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so I am on my way back from the shipwreck and I just stopped here in this low plain. So you can see this low coastal plain. Um, and I'm right in the middle of a huge and widely dispersed glaucous wing gull colony. So you can see here's some fledglings and adults hanging out in this pond. You can hear the adults all around me. They're not too happy that I'm here. Um, this whole area um, used to be part of the intertidal. So before the uplift event happened, um, this was covered by um, seawater at every high tide. Um, so this really represents one of the big changes to the island post-earthquake. Right? All of this habitat was opened up. Um, there are now tens of thousands of glaucous wing gull colon, um, sorry, glaucous wing gulls nesting on the island. Um, and they may be the most numerous seabird on the island. Um, another big change was these cliffs up here. So these bluffs used to be steep cliffs. Um, right about here, the ocean was actually able to come in and constantly erode the cliffs and keep them nice and steep. And so they were ideal habitat for cliff nesting seabirds. So that includes black leg kittiwakes, common murres, thick billed murres. Um, the top area was used by tufted puffins, um, rhino auklets. Some of those birds are still able to use the habitat, but um, black leg kittiwakes and pelagic cormorants, um, thick billed murres especially, um, are less likely to nest there, and common murres as well. Um, so now that the slopes have flattened out, um, those birds really aren't attracted to that habitat type. Um, but they do have an alternate option. And so right in here, you can see some of these towers and buildings. So this is an old Air Force base. I'm gonna head up there and we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, but this is a new type of habitat. And this is a habitat that the birds have really adapted to take advantage of. All right, and before we head back up, I just wanna give you one last look from the shipwreck, panning to the north. You can see the new plain created by the earthquake and then the old bluffs. And you can see the Air Force Base in the distance. Okay, so here I am um, up at the Air Force Base. And so the next chapter in the saga of Middleton Island is the story of the Air Force. So in the late 1950s and early 1960s, during the peak of the Cold War, uh, Middleton Island was home to an early detection facility. So it was an Air Force radar station um, that would detect potential Russian attacks on mainland US and relay that information. Um, so there was this whole Air Force base built here. It was built quickly, just in a couple of years, and it was only operational for another three or four years. Um, but when they left, they left all of their structures behind. And so you can see behind me, um, these are the old radar towers. So there are actually four of them here. Um, and then there's the old residence. So back here, this is where all of the Air Force airmen actually live. And you can see now that um, without cliffs, um, the natural cliffs on the edge of the island, the kittiwakes have really moved in. So they're using this st steep habitat, this structured habitat, um, to form colonies um, to use for nesting substrate. All right, and so here we are at the Kittiwake Wall. So this wall was built by researchers on the island, um, led by Scott Hatch and the Institute for um, Seabird Research and Conservation. Um, so this, um, these ledges were built in an old wall, an old part of the Air Force um, residence building. And now it's completely covered with nesting kittiwakes. So you can see they're really habitat limited on the island and they're really um, ready to move in as soon as new habitat becomes available. And then as I pan off to the north, you can see the four old radar stations. So there's one, two, and then there's the tall one in the background that you can't quite see um, just under the cloud there. So I'm gonna head over that way and we'll talk a little bit more about the towers. Okay. So I am standing in front of one of the center points of the research that happens out on Middleton. Um, this is the Seabird Tower. So this was one of the radar installations. Um, it supported a big dome. So back in the early 60s, there would have been a dome right up here, big dome that um, would detect incoming Russian attacks, basically. So incoming Russian planes. Um, today, it is a seabird colony. So there are hundreds and hundreds of kittiwakes that nest up along the um, shelves at the top of the tower. Um, there are also a couple hundred pelagic cormorant nests up there, a few murres, um, and it really gives unprecedented access to these birds. So I will take you up inside and show you what it looks like. Um, the front door is right here.
Top of the tower, we have two floors with about 800 windows. And at almost every window, there's either a black leg kittiwake or a pelagic cormorant nesting. And this space is really sort of an interface between a laboratory and a wild seabird colony. And it gives amazing access to observed nests, uh, capture chicks, capture adults, um, to get a better understanding of the life history and energetic requirements of several seabird species. So here we have a nice view of a kittiwake nest. Um, the alpha chick, so the first chick that hatches, gets a red forehead, and the beta chick gets colored blue, and that helps researchers keep track of which chick is which. We can compare the differences in growth rates between alpha and beta chicks. And as we scan across, you can see just how many nests. You can see this kittiwake is banded, so adults get color bands, and that lets us identify individuals. Another color banded adult. Here we have an alpha chick with a red head. And here we have a nest with an alpha and a beta chick. So you can see the windows get pretty dirty, but you can see the alpha there in front and the beta behind. The ISRC crew, they've been out here for about two months. I should note that we all self-quarantined for two weeks when we got here, and we've been here for about six weeks now, so we can relax social distancing guidelines. Um, so they're about to capture a kittiwake chick, and I'm gonna walk with them to the, to the nest. So we're grabbing the beta chick with the yep. blue forehead. <laughs> so we'll head over to the bench. We can collect more morphometrics. So start by massing the bird. So the weight is 361 grams. 361.1. So now we're going to take wing cord. Two sixty one wing. Next two tarsus. Now we'll do a tarsus measurement. Tarsus is thirty seven even. Next is head bill. Here we have a head bill measurement. Head bill is 85.8. .8. And the next Coleman. So now we'll do a Coleman measurement, which is the length at the top of the bill. Thirty-three point nine. Right. And now this chick will go back to the nest. A little more blue. After it gets a fresh coat of blue sharpie. So on the second floor of the tower, we have pelagic cormorants nesting. Um, the work I'm doing involves catching and tagging pelagic cormorants, so we can track them um, and also collect data about the environment that they're using. Um, but this island really gives us unique access to cormorants. And so here you can see some fluffy chicks.
here's the view out of one of the Cormorant capture slots. Cormorant is checking us out. Um, so this is red banded bird number 369. So this is a male pelagic cormorant. We use these slots to hook the bird by the leg and then we can open the window and reach out and catch them. So from here, I'm gonna take you back downstairs um, and we're gonna go check out the rhinoceros alclet colony. So down in the salmonberry. See you soon. Okay, so we are in the rhinoceros auklet or rhinoceros puffin colony. Um, they nest in burrows um, in the salmonberry here. So it's pretty thick, thorny brush. Um, but if we get down underneath, you can actually see the entrance to a few burrows here behind me. Um, so we've got a burrow right down here and then another one right up here. Um, and so I'm going to crawl back along this path up in here. Um, and we're going to go access a man-made burrow. So the crew that you met earlier doing um, blicky work or um, kitty wake work in the tower, um, they're a little bit ahead of me. And they've placed man-made burrow boxes or nesting boxes underground. And this allows researchers to have nice, easy and stable access so that they can um, get into the nest a few times a year, um, assess how well the chicks are doing and take some measurements um, on the chicks so they can look at chick growth. All right, so I'll see you in a second. Entrance is marked with a flag and a dog tag, and we put a garbage bag at the entrance of each burrow to make sure that nothing in there runs out as we try to access it. And so we have a rock on top of the access point for each of the burrows. I'm gonna move that out of the way. And so these artificial burrows that we have all have um, these little doors on top, which makes it easier for us to reach in and grab them. Okay, so that was pretty incredible. Um, Jenna just showed us the fledgling rhino auklet. Um, the bird was still in its nest, in its burrow, um, but based on its size and its wing development, I think it's probably ready to go. So it might leave the nest for the first time tonight or sometime in the next few nights. Um, the burrows that we took it out of are, are man-made. So the researchers actually placed the burrows in the ground and this allows them to access the colony repeatedly without fear of accidentally caving in an, a burrow. Um, and it also gives them the ability to place a door. So by placing a door, they're able to know exactly where the nest is and they're able to pull the chicks out and check in on them multiple times throughout the season. And that way we can quantify productivity. We know how many chicks are being fledged from the island. Um, it also allows us to take measurements so we can look at chick growth rates um, and that type of thing to understand how food may or may not be limiting um, chick productivity or, or rhinoceros oplet productivity on the island. Um, so here I am down in the salmonberry in the rhino colony, but if I just stand up and you look over my shoulder, there we have the tower again. Um, so Middleton Island really offers this incredible diversity and density um, of nesting seabirds and pretty much unprecedented access for researchers. It's really a pretty incredible spot. So I hope you enjoyed the tour. It was nice meeting you all. Thanks. Bye.